Welcome back. Uh, this is the last keynote address, and it's my very great pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker. Uh, professor Patrick Honehan was Professor of Economics in Trinity College, and at a time of considerable economic upheaval, I think he's a role model actually for an engaged civic intellectual, he accepted the challenge of becoming Governor of the Central Bank of Ireland. And for that, we owe you a deep debt of, debt of gratitude, I think, on behalf of the whole nation, Patrick. Mm. And it was my great pleasure as president of the Royal Irish Academy to recognize that with the Cunningham Medal. So thank you very much for that. He is now an honorary professor of economics, which means he doesn't get paid a penny. <laughs> <laughs> and he will talk to us on... Yeah. <laughs> and he will talk about the issue of trust and transactions in economics. So, Patrick. Thanks very much, Lou. Uh, okay, so I, I, I could start with uh, either of the following two questions. Do people trust economists? <laughs> or the other question is, are economists interested in issues of trust? Uh, well, I'm going to focus mainly on the second question. On the first question, uh, Anoro O'Neill reminded us a couple of days ago that um, that people have had enough of experts remark of, of the education minister Gove in the Brexit campaign specifically referred to economists. A, a, an earlier small group session which we had in this room, I think it was yesterday morning, I, I think we concluded that the small minority of economists that uh, are and were visible to the British public at the time of Brexit chiefly overconfident forecasters, received on average about uh, the degree of public confidence which they deserved. The large majority of economists do other things and are very little visible to the general public. So I'll come back later to the role of trust in economic policy, but I want to take the opportunity at this conference to reflect a little on the degree to which and the way in which economists have dealt with issues of trust. So as, as an outline, uh, briefly, I'm going to suggest that much of modern economic analysis analyzes synthetic substitutes for trust or for innate trustworthiness rather than trust per se. But there is a growing interest in more intrinsic aspects of trust, notably trust failures in finance and the cross-country growth consequences of variations between different countries in general level of trust and trusting behavior. And finally, I will return then, turn to the recently very practical and topical question of the economic policy questions around trust in intergovernmental financial policy dealings. Now, it's not just professional deformation which makes me take credit the title, um, or take finance as the lens through which to look at the economics of trust. Um, it really looms large, trust looms large in the whole area of, of finance, so I think it's a very much a warranted uh, strand of economics to look at. Well, do economists pay any attention to trust, or do they indeed rather ignore it? Well, if I look at the American Economic Review, which is a big um, journal, general journal, a uh, very prominent journal, and the sort of journal you would expect to see articles about trust in, if there were articles, I counted only two papers per annum over the past 20 years which explicitly mentioned trust in their abstracts. And that includes antitrust. So... <laughs> so... Uh, so that well under 2%, because there are two, but over, well over 2,000 papers published in the American Economic Review uh, d during that period. So that's well under 2%. So it looks as if the economists are not interested in trust at all. So um, we may as well go home a little early and finish the conference. But, <laughs> but then there's this famous, famous quote um, from the philosopher's favorite economist, uh, Kenneth Arrow, who said uh, 35 years ago, Virtually every commercial transaction has within itself an element of trust. And then he goes on to say, it can be plausibly argued 
that much of the economic backwardness in the world can be explained by the lack of mutual confidence. Now, when you consider the huge variation in living standards uh, in different countries across the world, that's a very striking statement. It's more or less saying, as somebody put it, Somalia plus trust equals Sweden in terms of living standards. Or if you'd like to put a number on it, if trust was got to the level that we see in the more advanced economies or close to it, you would be talking about a doubling of world income or a hundred trillion dollars. So it's a lot, uh, there's a lot of trust there according to Kenneth Arrow and he's not a soft mushy kind of guy, he's a very hard nosed economist. So is it a bit of a mismatch here? Nobody's writing about trust, but Kenneth Arrow says it's worth as much as the whole of the world economy today. Well, what economists have done, and this is the, the resolution of this paradox, what they've chiefly done in this area is the following. When trust is absent, and to the extent that trust is absent, economic agents mitigate the risks that they face by creating synthetic substitutes for trust and trustworthiness, or if you like, synthetic forms of trustworthiness. I leave it to you philosophers to refine these distinctions more precisely. But my point is that the it is the synthetic mitigants of the lack of trustworthiness that has been the focus of most economic analysis of these issues. Uh, like the most recent case, people are analyzing the blockchain technology, which, computer technology, which was introduced in Bitcoin. But that's only the latest wave in the invention of trust substitutes over hundreds of years, probably thousands of years, in, in economic interactions. And if we look across the subfields of economics that are concerned with these tr trust substitutes, we realize that we are talking about, well, the majority of the advances in economics in the past few decades. Um, yesterday, uh, at, at one of the sessions, Carmel McKinley already talked about Nobel Prize winners who have looked at issues which are related to trust. And by my count, more than half of the past 50 Nobelists have been working chiefly, chiefly in these areas. I counted 26 of 48 since 1991. Before that, not so much. But in the last, uh, that's quite a long time after all. So, for example, you have non-cooperative game theory, work of Thomas Schelling, for example, you mentioned. Your repeated games, punishment strategies for defection can replicate trust, reputation building. Then you get the economics of imperfect information, principal agent problems, moral hazard, um, when insured person takes more risks because he's, he's been insured, adverse selection, the risky person pays up for insurance, uh, famous examples of markets that will not work if there's too much of these one-sided information problems. Then there's the theory of the firm. Why, does it, why do firms exist? Why do people not just say, oh, I need somebody to, to write a, to, to do a photocopy. I need somebody to write a, uh, a strategy document. I will just commission one uh, on a transaction basis. And so there's a large literature on incomplete contracts and how firm, inter-firm relationships, intra-firm relationships uh, are used to substitute for the uh, impossibility of writing and enforcing contracts in situations of imperfect competition. The theory of regulation. Right there, you've got, a, 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 it, it's quite evident that what need for regulation if firms can be trusted. Now there's also been work on areas that are mo more closely connected to the sorts of issues of trust that we've been talking about over the last few days. There's a whole work about on behavioral <coughs> economics, um, the so-called so new institutional economics, and they'd be more recognizable as addressing issues of trust more directly, as well as entering into areas that depart from uh, narrow conceptions of individual rationality. So, so what is trust for, for the economist? We'll come to this trust game in a minute. Some economists have been 
satisfied with Partha Das Gupta's 1988 definition, which he advanced in a book that was edited by Diego Gambetta. He said, trustworthiness is a commodity, like other commodities. It's based on reputation, and that reputation has ultimately to be acquired through behavior over time in well understood circumstances. So it's a very concrete thing. You know, you want to get be trusted, you've got to behave in a certain way, but it's uh, well understood circumstances. So you can acquire, there are certain hoops you have to uh, jump over or go through to, um, to acquire, uh, to acquire re reputation and be trusted. And if so, even a dishonest salesman will find it in his interest to behave as if he were trustworthy. Well, I want to stress that well-established experiments, especially in small group game theory environment settings, show that economists do need to go beyond this. And here's where we come to the trust game. You may know all about the trust game. This is a conference on trust, but I didn't hear anybody, maybe they did at the session that I wasn't at, talk about the trust game. This is the sort of thing that the economists who do this sort of thing are, uh, are interested in. The trust game does not allow any opportunity to build reputation. But a complete lack of trust is not observed. So if Das Gupta was right, well, you're not going to be able to build reputation, so you're not going to be able to build trust. So we'll see a complete lack of trust as people uh, uh, engage in this game. Now, a disclaimer here, I'm describing the work of others. They're not areas in which I've myself made academic contributions. And some of their findings are more robust and more credible than others. And I think that judging the size of the pinch of salt with which one needs to take different research findings is a very important skill for the economic policymaker. Well, here's the trust game. You see the rules. You've already decided what you're going to, if you're going to be player A or player B, what you're going to uh, do. So let me go through it. First, the two players, there are only two players, are given three coins each. The first player may give some coins to the second player. If the first player does give some coins to the second player, the game manager steps in, and they know this, he will do this in advance. He matches this payment to the second player. So if the first player gives one coin to the second player, the game manager will come in and add a coin. Sometimes it's two coins, but in this particular example that I'm going to show you, it's just one coin. The second player may now give some coins to the first player. The game ends. Well, if we think about it, why would the first player give some coins to the second player? Well, let's see what the second player is going to do. No matter how many coins the second player has, the second player can go home with all those coins. So probably, Individually rational behavior is not to give any coins back. Knowing that the second player will not give any coins back, the first player will not give any coins to the second player. So the individually rational equilibrium of this game is no coins are given in either direction. Now what happens in practice? And this is, these, these results have been replicated many, many times. A particular example I want to take for a reason we'll come back to later in the talk comes from Peru, from Dean Carlin's paper in 2005 in the American Economic Review. Does use the word trust in the title. <laughs> so, how many coins were passed? These percentages of time, the time. Well, we see that fewer than a quarter of the players have played the individual rational response. Now, you can say, well, probably someone didn't understand the game and they, they just thought, well, yeah, but only a, less than a quarter, and the rest of them all handed over more coins than seemed individually rational. By the way, they also handed over more coins. It, it, they didn't do well by, by handing over more coins. On average, the, the, this 39% that handed over one coin, on average, they got 0.89 of a coin back. The players who played two coins got on average 1.71 coins back. So it wasn't as if uh, they saw through and saw something that we can't see, but they didn't behave in the individually rational way. 
It's very hard to explain this behaviour on the basis of individual rational uh, behaviour. There does suggest that there, it does suggest that there is some kind of non-rational propensity to trust that you are going to get something back. Something is going on. Now, as we'll see, the trust game can also help to provide measures of the degree to which there is trust, trusting and trustworthy characteristics. And that complements the survey questionnaires, which can be very much criticised. But though drivers of variation in trustworthiness and other aspects of behaviour are not captured by assumptions of individual rationality, and, that they, and they may be important, they're not easily handled with current analytical tools. And though it's less neglected than sometimes alleged, this work has made slower progress than the analysis of what I've called synthetic substitutes for trust. Now I want to emphasize that it, it hasn't been entirely neglected and that neglect, although uh, it, it was more prevalent in the past, uh, it was not absolute even in the early, late, late 80s, early 90s. Let me, um, here's a picture of, of a map of the Mediterranean in the 11th century. <coughs> I'm not sure if it's the 11th century. It purported to be, and it occurs to me that maybe, maybe it's not exactly the 11th century. But I put it up because of a study, very widely cited study and, and thought about study uh, by Abner Greif of long distance trade in the Mediterranean in the 11th century. And his insight, he's an economic historian, his insight is that long distance trade in the Mediterranean going from the south of Spain to right across to, to um, Egypt and down into actually into the um, Red Sea. It was made possible by the trust sustained by a kind of multilateral reputation mechanism among Jewish merchants that deterred opportunism in bilateral relations by ostracizing abusers. So you say, okay, I'm going to get, send an order to Spain and when the goods come, I'm actually not going to pay because I never really need to deal with Spain again. Yeah. But the man in Spain knows other merchants in this broad, loose, informal community of merchants in the Mediterranean. And he'll put the word around and there'll be a multilateral mechanism. And so Greif argued that and, and by the way, contrast here, in the following century, uh, Jewish traders are still there, Maghrebi traders, um, but the, the Genoese merchants became prominent in the 12th century. But their behavior, their way of dealing with this, relied more on contracts and legal enforcement in Genoa. And so they had a more limited trading network, their more individualistic behavior, Greif argued that social and cultural factors influenced what method of uh, supporting trade prevails in a given society, and that related cultural beliefs influence subsequent contractual, organizational, and legal development over time. I mention that to emphasize that these social, uh, historical, cultural factors have uh, Leaching in, been leaching into economics for the past 25, 30 years. Now, apart from being a social construct, as that example suggests, many scholars think that trust and trustworthiness are likely to have personal or innate sources. Economists don't try to analyze the determinants of such tr trustworthiness, but they do analyze its consequences. And let me give you two areas. Um, Trust, per se, has got a lot of attention in two particular areas. It's in the study of developing economies that variations, differences in trust levels, whether driven by cultural or historical factors, uh, has received the greatest amount of attention. And I'll return to those later. But I want to emphasize <coughs> problems in financial regulation. The shock of the financial crisis focused attention on the degree to which financial firms and financial regulatory policy 
have betrayed the trust that was generally placed in them. And this has led to a chastened profession having to boost research in subfields such as behavioural economics, to which the analysis of the determinants and the consequences of variations in trust belongs. Um, I, I was at the annual meeting of the, of the American Economic Association uh, last year, and I, I was struck by the fact that everybody was talking about this. The, not only the Richard Taylor, who was the new president of the, of the uh, association, who's a behavioral economist, so naturally he would give his address on behavioral economics, but somebody that I recognized and knew as a, a very traditional, hard-nosed, um, uh, don't give me the waffle, give me the facts, um, economist John Campbell's, his, his um, plenary lecture, Richard Ely plenary lecture, talked about mistakes, the importance of mistakes in consumer saving and investment and how public policy should deal with mistakes. Traditional economics doesn't talk about mistakes, it talks about individual rationality. If trust is weak, then finance cannot contribute to growth as it should. Trust in financial institutions has fallen, not least in Ireland. I think I have a, a slide showing you, um, we know what, what do these may mean, but the change, this is the change in the proportion of the general population expressing confidence in financial institutions. Now, <clears throat> make what you will of, of these, but uh, the striking thing, well, the reason I'm showing it to you, is that Ireland there is, in, is circled in green right at the bottom. The change in the confidence in financial institutions between 2009-10, the surveys are done at slightly different times in different countries, uh, compared to 2006-07 before, before the crisis. A dramatic fall in whatever this measures, there's a dramatic fall in it. it it's <laughs> of course, unemployment has gone up a lot, uh, had gone up a lot in Ireland at that time. You say, well, people are just miserable about everything. And I could show you another show, uh, graph which shows the government as well, the last conference in the government. Um, but unemployment went up even higher in other countries without the same loss of, of confidence. So we definitely have a, a dramatic fall in, in uh, measured survey measures of confidence. Why? Hardly need to tell you. Uh, just give you some examples. Why is there loss of confidence in Irish financiers? Most dimensions of trust were betrayed. So you have both competence, uh, we talk about competence, reliability and, and, uh, and honesty. I think those are the terms that, that Nora O'Neill uh, likes to, to uh, lay out as, as um, uh, criteria for trustworthiness. Um, the egregious loan losses, well that certainly there was misplaced trust in the competence of banks and indeed in their irregulator. Um, as far as the other aspects, well, there's a famous case, the Custom House Capital case, which is the, the, the uh, judge, Justice Gerard Hogan, uh, referred to a sort of Irish Ponzi scheme. And the man mainly in charge, Mr. Harry Cassidy, he was disqualified for being, from being a company director for 14 years. Doesn't sound particularly <laughs> tough. Uh, so this looks like uh, like fraud. Oh, now I have to move. I have to move <laughs> um, Sharp practice. So going beyond fraud, we have sharp practice and the tracker rates case. Borrowers trusted banks to treat fairly with them and at least not go beyond the contractual arrangements. I suppose people said if the banks put in the small print, they're going to enforce the small print. But actually, the bank said, uh, well, we've looked at the small print and you can't have a tracker rate, rate anymore. But that's not what the small print really said. So the trust was betrayed, and this is an integrity dimension. In fact, the banks interpreted small print in their own favour and crossed, crossed the line. Actually now, when Irish loan losses were matched only in Iceland, in the competence dimension and, the, and on the reliability and integrity dimension, there are even worse cases abroad on, on the reliability and integrity dimension. On the reliability, we remember the failure for weeks of uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland's payment system. Um, I think that was in, in 2013. And, uh, and there are many, many integrity abuses. I'll show you some nice pictures of people. There we are. There is um, this the top fellow is um, on the left hand side is Mr. Alan Stanford. He, he's actually the biggest banker um, to have been jailed uh, after the crisis. You might not have heard of him, but um, his, uh, his several banks that he owned in the United States and in the Caribbean uh, collapsed. He was jailed for 
in the American style, 110 years <laughs> for fraud. Just 14 years not being a company director doesn't seem so, so uh, har harsh in that light. And the other man was mentioned earlier, we all know his name, Bernie Madoff, and he was jailed for 150 years for fraud. So there was misplaced trust in these guys and in regulation. And there are another bunch of guys there, there, there in Britain, so there's no purple wall pictures there. They look, uh, they look reasonably well dressed. Uh, these chaps were jailed in 2016 for, for, um, for rigging the, the rate, that the uh, interest rate that they, uh, they posted in order to get bonuses. The first man was Mr. Jay Merchant. He was sentenced to six and a half years in prison. And there are other people four years. The third one was two years and nine months. And another man got a longer sentence in 2015. Anyway, the point about this is to say that uh, this is not a unique Irish situation. This is very widespread across the financial sector, exposed by the, by the crisis, but had been going on for a long time. Now, what should government financial policy do about this? Well, ex post, betrayal of trust should lead to sanctions. I meant to say that before I showed the pictures. The purpose of the pictures is to show, yes, there have been sanctions. As enough, how many? But there have been sanctions. But this is a very important area. But ex ante, it'd be better if these things didn't happen. So there should be better regulation, but how? In order to know how to regulate better, we need to understand what is going on and the impact of different kinds. Of, uh, of, of regulation. So if financial firms have become less trustworthy in recent times, why is this? Let me suggest three areas. The human element of trust and creditworthiness assessments have been replaced by automated systems. We have high-powered reward systems and we have an exploitation by financial firms of behavioral biases. Take the first one. In finance, the face-to-face -face, uh, the face-to-face -face character and, and static business models were replaced by formal automated decision systems based on objective measures. Trust was reduced to collateral and expert systems. Bankers were no longer expecting to say is this person creditworthy? Can I assess that person as a creditworthy person? The personal element was taken out of it. Mm -hmm. And then in addition, there were high-powered reward systems that introduced new and, and opaque principal agent problems. Um, bankers were able to earn huge bonuses for small deviations away from mm -hmm. good, good behavior. So the net result was that financiers started to think that as long as you follow the mechanical decision rules, and these included the bank's own internal risk management rules and the regulatory structures that had been imposed from outside, as long as you followed and stayed within those decision rules, any form of making money was just fine. It, nothing in question of integrity, trustworthiness, creditworthiness didn't come into it. And then, also, as in other business sectors, that's my the third point, you have the development of more sophisticated marketing research combined with advances in behavioral psychology, presenting firms with opportunities to exploit behavioral biases which altered the degree to which they were trustworthy. You have predatory lending, where you lend money to somebody who is not going to be able to pay back in order to get more than you could have if you're just with penalties, uh, with, with grabbing the collaterals that are worth more than the loan and so forth. <coughs> Fees for unauthorized overdrafts very much in the same territory. You know that the people that you have allowed, given them an overdraft, knowing that they will uh, not be competent to maintain within the overdraft limit and you'll be able to uh, charge them a large fee. So in this, these areas, misplaced trust was betrayed. A long period of profitable success had generated a hubris and overconfidence. Bankers trusted their risk management people. Regulators trusted the bankers. Economists trusted the regulators. As Honor O'Neill has emphasized, trust should be a response to trustworthiness. And neither the competence 
or in at least some cases the integrity of the targets of financial trust justified that trust. So, how do we improve things? We want to build financial systems whose firms won't fail by accident. So they want to be, we want them to be competent. Won't be deliberately looted by the insiders. We want them to, that's a, an aspect of integrity. We'll offer consistent service, reliability. Won't abuse their monopoly power. Again, an aspect of, of, um, of integrity. <coughs> Well, you think of what kind of regulation do you want? Uh, are the regulations that are there effective? Should they be added to? Should they be substituted? Three, well, five uh, elements need to be considered. Is the regulation that you introduce, or is there already, open to being gamed? Is it potentially counterproductive? Is it well targeted at the problem? And then you have to consider adverse side effects. Will, will this uh, reduce in, uh, result in a reduction in credit, in growth? Will it increase costs to an unacceptable extent? Let me just give you uh, a couple of points on these three things that can go wrong with, with regulations open to being gained. Relying on clear-cut rules is not enough. I've already suggested that by saying that the fact that there was a mechanical set of rules was a, like a target to go around. All we need to do is to go around the rules. Yes, if the rule is good enough, a heuristic, then it could be useful and, and cost effective, but only if the regulated person has the same incentive as the, re as, as the regulator. Otherwise, the room, rule would be gamed and manipulated even though the regulated person is formally compliant. And in finance, it's all too often heads I win, tails you lose. And let me give a, 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 an example of how you can get over this. So you have to have rules, for example, minimum capital adequacy rules. These can be gamed too by uh, working on the definitions of capital, working on the risk weights. So the regulator can keep shifting the target, use multiple shifting rules, and this has been pioneered in the United States since the crisis for minimum bank capital requirements, and they've stumbled into this almost by accident. They've supplemented the standing percentage rules by annually changing stress test exercises with unpredictable scenarios and non-transparent methodology. So the banks never know from year to year what will the Fed come up with next, what scenario in which we might lose a lot of money will the Fed come up with and say you've got to have enough capital to meet that particular risk. Unfortunately, there is strong anti-regulation liberalization pressure in the United States to relax precisely this arbitrariness and um, unpredictability and op opacity of this regulation. That's a, a priority for uh, d uh, people who want to return to the errors of the past in the United States. The ECB, by the way, in Europe has also adopted this uh, changing every two years. They, they do a stress test with changing scenarios. So that's the open to being game. What about, what about counterproductive? Let me give you an example of counterproductive, or potentially counterproductive. Conflicts of interest, they've been very important uh, in, in many ways, in this crisis and in other abuses. And people say, well, the answer is just disclose the conflict of interest. You s people then will know what they're dealing with. But actually, experiments suggest that this might actually not be good enough, not only will it, might it not be good enough, but it might actually result in counterproductive behaviour from both buyer and seller. Experiments suggest that actually disclosure could on average reduce consumer welfare. Certain things like this. I've disclosed to you that I have a conflict of interest, so <clears throat> I can really exaggerate the benefits of the product I'm selling because I actually have told him, he knows that I'm going to exaggerate, so I better exaggerate even more. <laughs> you might say, well, the buyer would probably respond to that by being more sceptical. But apparently in these experiments, the buyers are lulled by the forthrightness of the disclosure. Well, he was very straightforward there. He's told me a conflict of interest. So what he's telling me now, you know, in fairness, uh, actually, maybe I should, he has told me it's very good. Maybe it's not quite as good, but I'm anchoring. That's uh, one of the behavioral characteristics. We tend to focus on what we're told and then apply a, dis a skepticism discount. So the new exaggeration will be the anchor. Hmm. Or I might succumb to what's called the burden of disclosure. He's told me that he has a special interest in this product. 
I, I better buy it all the same because if I don't buy it, he'll think that it's only because. <laughs> so it's better to remove the conflict than to rely on mandating the disclosure. Now, finally, are the regulations missing the target? A lot of regulations have not taken account of the use and manipulation by, um, by uh, uh, financial firms of these behavioural error proneness to errors. This, this manipulation, um, you need to deal with, with these in a slightly different way than in a situation where you assume that the consumer, uh, all he needs to do is be, get sufficient information. There's a great st statement from the former head of the British Financial Conduct Authority. Financial Conduct Authority will not be afraid to shine a light on the murkier psychological enticements and entrapments that exist in financial services, the dark arts of behavioural economics, <laughs> the pushes and pulls, the frames and biases that we sometimes see used to entice customers to buy financial products they may not need or that might, not be, that might be wholly unsuitable for them. Now, this is a great manifesto and it points in an entirely different direction to what had been done up to, up to now in regulation in different countries. It was not long after that that Wheatley was told he was not going to be renewed, and he's gone off to, I think it's Hong Kong or somewhere, and um, the Financial Conduct Authority's review of culture at banks was cancelled in December 2015. Well, maybe if financial firms hired different types of people, Well, this is not a measure of trustworthiness, but it's a measure of something quite similar, really, um, altruism of workers in different sectors. And it's from a British survey from 2016, and it, it's, it's a game called the Ultimatum Game, and it, you're, you're asked what, a lot of things about yourself, and what sector do you work in? And I want to focus on the what sector do you work in answer. And the people in the food and drink sector, I um, can't remember exactly how this game is structured, but it, the amount of money that they were prepared to hand over uh, is a measure of their altruism, whatever that means. It doesn't put finance <laughs> in a very <laughs> good light if you like to think that financial sector workers are as altruistic as the average. So maybe something has to be done. How to deliver this? That's not easy. We had a paper from uh, the Icelandic um, participant this morning, uh, every country has fitness and probity rules. You can't become a senior uh, banker without uh, assessing whether you're fit. That means competent and, and proper. It means something to do with integrity. But maybe the standards are not well defined. Maybe they need to be tougher. Very hard to define them in a way that gets you somebody who's likely to perform higher up on the, um, on, on the altruism or indeed on the, on the trustworthiness. Now, I'm, 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 uh, I'm not moving along fast enough. Let me finish there with financial regulation and speak very briefly about the cross-country comparisons. I'll just skim through this to give you a hint of, of the work that's been done. Data-driven work. Economics has become very empirical study in the 1960s and 70s. It was a very theoretical discipline. Um, and people still think it's a very theoretical discipline, but it's not. It has become extremely empirical. It's almost impossible to get a pure theory paper published, except in, in, in a, a number of journals that nobody reads anymore. <laughs> More trusting countries have higher incomes. It's an intriguing cross-country fact. Now, these are questions about generalized trust. They're not saying trust in government, trust in this, trust in that. Gen generally speaking, would you think you can trust people or do you think you can't be too careful? Questions like this are asked on a, a common basis across countries. And this is these are measures of income per capita and uh, up on the, the y-axis and generalized trust. You see Ireland up there, pretty, pretty high generalized trust, pretty high income per capita, actually above the line for income per capita. So not talking about Ireland here, I'm, the evidence really is coming from, from the uh, less developed countries and that, that a general upward trend. By the way, when you do this for individuals and find out uh, how well individuals are doing based on their uh, tendency to answer positively to this trust, generalized trust question, you don't get a straight upward dimension. You get a, quite a clear hump shape. You can be, and we heard this in, in several other sessions, you can be too trusting. Mm -hmm. and you won't do very well. 
But you can be too, your trust, generalized trust level can be too low for your own uh, financial well-being. So what's going on in these countries? And why is it more trusting? It's, um, and not only is, you say, well, this is a snapshot. And we had a very interesting paper about the, the way in which reported levels of trust in government and so on um, change over time in the business cycle and so on. Lasting. But actually some of these differences in trust levels are very, very long lasting. There's a very nice paper about uh, Africa. Um, this is a map of Africa and it shows you the number of people in each ethnic group. Uh, the number of people who were enslaved and brought across the Atlantic in some period in the 1662, 18 something. Uh, and there's a, the, the chaps who studied this, not in they also looked at Indian Ocean uh, slavery as well, so they didn't just. And, and they asked the question is there more generalized trust as measured in the way it is described in, in, in these countries that didn't suffer so much from slavery? Or is this, does it not have anything to do with generalized trust? And they found a very strong relationship. The more slavery, the more people that are enslaved, the less trusting those societies are, even today, which was two, it's just 250 years after what happened. So these are hugely long-lasting features. And those are also the poorest countries in the world. In economics, where is this coming in? Where, what's the mechanism? What's the mechanism that goes from trust to growth? And one idea is, but this is maybe professional deformation again, <laughs> many researchers point to credit or finance as uh, the root. Lots of econometric research uh, has talked about the link between finance and growth, and we know that finance, measures of finance, uh, survive the econometric tests better than many other cross-country comparisons in education systems, health systems, so on and so forth. The finance is the, is the variable that is robust. And where there is more generalized trust, there is more participation in finance. If we go back to those Peruvian coins in the, in the trust game, and by the way, those coins, they've got three coins. Those are coins were, you know, if we compared it to, they were for poor, poor people in, in, in Peru, uh, you should think of them mainly basically as a coin that's worth about 20 euros. So this was a, a real game. There was real money at, at, at stake. And this, that study was, uh, was done in collaboration with a microfinance lender. And the microfinance lender had lent to all these people. And what the researchers found was that the people who were more trustworthy, the people that the... the Player B people who gave more money back were also the people who repaid their loans. So there's this link between a trusting behavior, trustworthy behavior, and ability to participate effectively in the financial system. And there are other studies too, a study in, in Italy. Italy is a great source of information about social capital and um, well I don't think it's free to take too, too much time on that they find that the people who report actually report uh, yeah I'm generally trusting they also participate more uh, they, they you know go to the they have bank accounts they buy insurance products and so forth so there's a link between the link between trust and finance we know this link between finance and growth, and so maybe that's part of what's going on. Now, maybe it's all, this is all just summary. I'm sure it's just all summaries of deeper things that are affecting uh, growth factors. And of course, what are there economic determinants of trust in this sense? i just show you, flash that up quickly. More trusting countries have lower inequality. And this is also said to be a causal relationship, according to the researchers that have studied it, that they think that lower inequality drives a higher degree of, of trusting behavior. Now, my, so I hope I've, I've um, shown that multiple aspects of trust matter explicitly or implicitly in the heart of economics and even its hard-nosed end, namely finance. Let me end with, with trust and how, <laughs> how it matters also in, not in dealings of individuals with banks or, or with each other, but in intergovernmental economic and financial relations. 
the trust does definitely and clearly matter there, it's obvious. It also matters in the market for sovereign debt. Unfortunately, official international lending in Europe operates in a political environment where an unfortunate lack of trust among senior politicians exists against the background of well-founded concerns about moral hazard. Uh, and this is a decisive element. The cross-country trust in Europe broke down in the Euro area crisis. And this deepened the crisis, uh, especially for Greece, but also, and the other borrowers, but also for the entire zone. And the lenders themselves <laughs> haven't done a great job of building trust. I read Yanis Varoufakis' uh, recent book. It's a very interesting read. He gives very many examples about talk behind closed doors, which is immediately contradicted as soon as the television cameras comes in. Um, if we were to believe him, this is uh, so certainly not the way to build trust. He himself, of course, abuses trust, recording private meetings and publishing the contents. Um, the Irish state worked hard from a low position, not very well trusted at the point of crisis, to rebuild trust both with the lenders and with its well-educated electorate. So let me just end with a couple of remarks about how did Irish negotiators build trust with lenders. And I return to the three uh, characteristics of trustworthiness, competence, reliability, and integrity. Competence, the Irish side tried to show, uh, tried to show that they realized the scale of the problem and the nature of the available solutions and showed that they could deliver anal analytical papers, explanatory papers, showed that they were, uh, through openness, uh, the Irish side's capacity to overcome the problems. So competence, displaying competence, was a clear objective and an explicit objective uh, among the, the negotiators and the, the officials dealing with, with this side. Reliability, well here, uh, deliver what you promise as soon as, as soon as you agree something, agree something you can do and make sure that you deliver it on time. Concession over things that don't matter, ingenuity and firmness on things that did and keep your disputes behind closed doors. But then there's the integrity dimension. Mm. How, do you com how do you convince in oh, integrity? And the way I think the Irish side tried to do that was to keep steering and ensuring the program in such a way that it was broadly where government, recognizing realities, felt it needed to go. So that it was demonstrably true that we were essentially seeking protection of the lenders from the private financial markets, not to do, to achieve a plausible outcome. Realizing this, the lenders came to trust that they would not be double-crossed because it would not be in Ireland's interest mm. to move away from what was agreed. And so that's where concession over things that don't much matter, we'll do them anyway, don't want to do that, but not important, silly, but we'll do it. Things that do matter, hold firm, or work around so that actually we do a different version that actually works for, for us. So the lenders start to realize we're not going to be double-crossed here. These people want to get out of the hole as badly as we want them to get out of the hole and want to get our money back. So that allowed the Irish side to press on financial terms and concessions and conditions. And as we've seen, the more trustworthy you are, the better you will be able to perform in the financial con contract. Look, I've abused your patience, if not your trust, this afternoon. And uh, let me stop there and answer a few questions. Uh, you had your hand up first, so yeah. Thanks very much. Um, uh, no, Patrick, that was, that was great. Um, on the, um, one, one observation I'd just like to, to put and ask for your response to is, um, you noted the tendency since the crisis, at least in the case of the UK, for 
uh, strong for an innovative regulatory framework to be proposed in some respects and then backsliding. And we're seeing it happen now in America as well, and you noted that. Um, it seems to me that's been a pattern over at least the last sort of century and a half in, in banking regulation that we don't seem to remember. There seems to be poor systemic remembering uh, of the lessons of crises that are produced by, by um, dodgy behavior. Right, that, that, so one seems to observe this cycle of the bad behavior in the financial sector, breakdowns of trust, producing crisis, uh, there's a regulatory response um, which gets sustained for a little while, but then um, it seems that memory doesn't stick in the system. The regulations are relaxed or the regulators could go to sleep and get captured or, uh, and, and we cycle through again. Right? I mean, the, the, that seems to be a bit of a pattern. So just, um, so on the one hand, we've got this, the, the 250 year residue uh, of trust effect, trust related effects that you pointed out in the African case. Um, but at the same time, there are, uh, the, the history of regulatory regulation and relaxation regulation seems to suggest poor cultural mm. uh, yeah. memory of these things. This is, this, uh, is called in the literature disaster myopia. Um, <laughs> And, and it seems to be getting shorter. <laughs> but but um, I, I don't want to imply that nothing has been done and that the system isn't sa safer. It is. There's much more capital and people are being hauled off. And that and, and it's a, que a question of degree and a question of concern that there, there could be a, um, a, 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 a return of departure. I think it's very natural that, that uh, people backslide. They, they do things that are, sometimes, some of the things they do are for show only, and therefore as soon as the show is not required, they, they won't do it anymore. Uh, but there are also powerful interests at play, and uh, it's, um, there are an awful lot of people who were, did not behave in a trustworthy manner and who are now very rich, and who have not suffered particular consequences from this. I would actually feel that the, um, a, a number of structures in society more widely than just the financial sector were ripe for, um, for a, a, you know, a deep rethink, uh, and, and yet that hasn't occurred, to, and it hasn't occurred to a, a, to a much greater extent than in the 1930s. Uh, in the United States, uh, and, and when well, everything changed in the United States in, in terms of oh, policy stance, in a way that lasted for 50 years. Oh. No, move, you have to move now, I can't do this. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah. Okay, I think Cormac, and then that's a question here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. For Could you keep it short, you. please, Cormac? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Quick incidental thing. Um, yeah. On the issue of trust, scientists, as you know, famously sort of sometimes give out about economists. And the simple reason is once a year we'll see a lovely sober prediction in the Irish Times from the head of the central bank or a lovely economist saying the economy is forecast to grow, grow by one plus or minus a half percent, I'd say. And what happens a few months later is we discover a year later that it actually grew by 3%. And everybody's delighted except the physicists and the mathematicians. And we say, well, three is a long way from, from, from mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And then we know, especially the next year, mm -hmm. another projection, yeah. but it's the same error margin. You know? And to us, it's like, but doesn't that mean that they, they haven't realized the ones they haven't? There's nothing wrong with the model. What's wrong is their confidence in their model is, yeah. is, is, is over. Would you like to say something? No, I fully agree with that. The, the, uh, uh, there is not enough attention paid to uh, to, to error error bounds. Now there is a, ten, a tendency in in re more recent times to publish error bounds, but the problem is uh, that the problem that the forecasters they shy away from those because those error bounds are very wide, mm -hmm. and uh, you have uh, these fan diagrams that show they say, oh well, it seems that uh, growth is going to be two percent next year, but with probability, uh, what what's the you know, 95% confidence interval for, goes from minus 1% to plus 4.5%, so that's not very good. Uh, forecasting is not uh, really at the heart of, of what economists do. I, I participate in a, in a survey of policy economists, uh, European policy economists, done by people in Chicago. They have one for America, they have one for Europe, and there are about 30 uh, of a lot of different strands of, of thought and, and, you know, political preferences and approaches to life. And it is surprising, they ask very specific questions. You know, would Europe be better off if Uber were, were allowed to uh, be active in, you know, in, in all, all markets? These sorts of very specific policy questions. And it is surprising how uh, concentrated the distribution of answers is. There are some questions where the economists are widely apart. People talk about this 
six economists, seven, uh, <laughs> seven views. That, that is less true than you would think on qu questions on which economists sh should have views because decisions are going to be taken on them. But they should also indicate they uh, be, be more humble. And that was part of the cost problem of the crisis. People thought they could risk manage because they knew what was going to happen, but they didn't know what was going to happen. Okay, okay there was one question here, then an aura. So. Oh, thanks. I was really interested in the causal relationship, if any, between trust mm. and economic growth or economic inequality. Mm. So I'm perhaps generally suspicious, but mm. could the relationship or the causal link not go the other way? Yeah. So that because you're wealthier, um, you tend to be more trusting? Yeah, I think this is a... For, first of all, the answer is that the researchers attempt to, to identify this through uh, techniques of a, the class yeah. of instru instrumental variables approach. Mm -hmm. This is... Uh, it's like we, we heard yesterday in the, the question of climate change and the, the level of... The, at the last move is lower, lower your confidence limit because you, there could be model error. And the problem with the instrumental variable approach is that it's only as good as the assumptions, the maintained hypothesis that you have about the, uh, the, whether the instrumental variable satisfies the statistical requirements. So this is a, a highly disputed, it's, the technique is correct, but the application is uh, subjective. But uh, I, I wouldn't have shown you these results if I didn't think that uh, this, is, this is reasonably interesting, plausible hypothesis. Uh, but it could be overturned. And a lot of results that are, were, were popular to talk about 10, 20 years ago have now been overturned, but people said, no, this is, this is not uh, okay. And Nora next, and then. Uh, yes, uh, I wonder whether you could comment a bit on the limits of uh, regulation in this matter, because I suppose that one of the things that uh, emerged in the UK was a sense that uh, a good deal of regulation not that regulation isn't necessary in this state, it's absolutely essential, but some regulation is counterproductive and indeed incentivizing a degree of cynicism and ultimately lack of trustworthiness. And the response, and I declare an interest because I'm a part of it, has been the Banking Standards Board, which is not a regulator but owned by the sector. So we are a membership organization paid for by the banks that are members uh, and we do something that makes them very uncomfortable, but they say is valuable, they wouldn't remain members, which is to conduct a pretty in-depth scrutiny of what's actually going on within banks with, at every level from counter staff upwards, and then we share it with them, and it's up to them whether they make it public or not, mainly they uh, uh, are feeling their way on that. But I think that uh, if we want to see um, uh, a growth in cultures of trustworthiness, we probably do have to pay attention to the cultural factors mm -hmm. that exist within these institutions. <coughs> and uh, okay, it's an experiment. We're doing it. We're two years in. It seems to have some good effects we have an increase in what a decrease in membership. Um, well, I, you know, as I said, um, a, a lot of regulation could be, could be counterproductive or could be missing the target. And I'm quite sure that there are a lot of legacy rules, and maybe some that are only of recent legacy, uh, that are, are totally wasteful and uh, just adding to, adding to cost. Um, and why, for example, in, in Ireland, would we impose such regulations if we uh, thought that they were wasting the time of, of officials and, and the banks and costing it? To some extent, these are internationally negotiated. If we don't comply, uh, we'll be seen, first of all, we will be a target for, for abuse. People say, ah, oh, they don't have that rule there, but I can actually use it. It was never effective, but since they don't have it, I can channel a huge mm -hmm. amount of fraud mm -hmm. through it. Um, and there'll be a reputational damage. They're very difficult to get agreement on, mm. and dismantling them is likely to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So I think it is a, it's, it's, um, I, I think these, getting uh, simplification, uh, rationalization is desirable, 
but I don't want it to be used as an excuse for eliminating. And you don't want it either, but it, 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 there is that. There is that risk. No, no I I, I'm not in the least in mm. favour of uh, removing regulation, let alone defying it unilaterally. I mm. think that that would be very counterproductive. But the question really is uh, that we have a lot of people who think ever more minute regulation would deliver for us, yeah. and I'm simply not sure whether. No. That way. I think everybody, including the people who sign up to and agree in these international agreements, uh, thinks that regulation has become too complex, unwieldy and too costly. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, sweeping it all away it, it, it could, could not be done, so it's a very difficult process to simplify mm -hmm. and maintain effectiveness. Okay, I think we have one last question up here. Did you have a question? No? Okay. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, I did actually. I still want to pick up on something that Dina said about the correlation between um, equal society, you know, societies that are more equal to opportunity um, and societies mm. that are trust, trusting, mm. perhaps trustworthy. Because um, I, I kind of had a Dina's instinct that it, it, it might go in the opposite direction to, to which you, that you suggested. Mm. Than you suggested. Yeah. Um, so, and in particular, I thought that your social and material circumstances might make it much easier for you to trust because if trust involves risk you might think being you know very poor for example might make it the case that it's much harder for you to take a risk okay and hmm. um, it's, it's, so and perhaps even it might affect trustworthiness hmm. you know it, it might just be more difficult to kind of fulfill your commitments if your social and material circumstances are sort of, um, how do you say, uncertain or unstable or... Yeah. Well, I just made two points on that. First of all, um, inequality isn't the same as having poor people. Yeah. Because you yeah, can have okay. large inequality in very rich countries like the United States. So, 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 so uh, uh, the second question is, this, I see this as something that has to be an empirical issue. Of course, the mechanisms can be, they're much more complex than can be captured in a simple linear regression. But the, it is an empirical question. Yeah. And, uh, and ha the mechanisms you describe very plausible. But are they empirically relevant? That's yeah. what we have okay. to, to, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> The follow to that perhaps would be surely if that were logically consistent, then um, less equal or, or perhaps related to that poorer people would be more conservative, which they are not um, politically. So, I'm, not, I'm not sure. It's, it's mixed, I think. So if, if, if you were financially conservative because everything was a higher risk. You know? hmm. Hmm. Poverty, uh, on poverty and trust, poverty cooperation. Can you leave a letter with the stamp on? Remember, if we're talking about a hundred countries here, one point at a time, please. Yeah. 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 Sorry, can we, can we let Patrick answer, please, Gloria? Yeah. So can we let Patrick answer? Yeah. I was just going to make the remark that if we're talking about a hundred countries, uh, extrapolating from our own experience of, of certain types of society may not be capturing what's mm. happening between different types of society. Fair enough. Um. Okay. okay, I think, um, thank you very much, Patrick. I think we should thank our speaker. <laughs> and thanks to everyone who helped organize this conference. And, uh, have a good trip home. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.